And the moderator for our next session is Brianne. And so I'll hand it over to you, Brianne. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Great. So we're just waiting for one more panelist. But I did hear from Kleber that there is a rainstorm and uh, his power was going out, flickering lights. So hopefully, oh, they're there. So it looks like everybody's here. Just give another minute. Thank you to our European colleagues who are joining in the middle of the night. Great, I'll get started. So thank you for joining our session on empowering early career researchers to improve science. Our panelists today are Humberto Debat, um, who'll be talking about his role in Panlingua. We have Dr. Nafisa Jadavi, uh, who will be talking about her role in reproducibility for everyone. We have Dr. Gary McDowell, um, who's working with Light Toller as a consultant, uh, and we'll talk about his work with Future of Research. We also have Cleaver Neves, who will be talking about his role with the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative. I'm the moderator today, Brianne Kent. I was an organizer of the event that we'll be talking about today that really inspired this panel. And I'm an assistant professor in neuroscience at Simon Fraser University in Canada. I'll welcome our co-moderator, Tracy Weisgerber, who um, is a member of the eLife Early uh, Career Advisory Group and works at Quest in Berlin. Uh, and she was the lead organizer of the event that has inspired this panel. It is uh, very late in Germany, so she's not going to have a formal presentation today, but she's, she's joining us um, just the same, which is wonderful. So this panel was inspired by ideas generated during a global virtual unconference. And an unconference is an unconventional conference which really tries to take the strengths and benefits of the coffee chats that happen at a conference and turn it into the main highlight. So we're really trying to promote discussion, debate, um, participation in an unconference instead of just having somebody give a talk and people listen um, like what's happening right now. So our unconference had brought 54 invited participants. They were mostly early career researchers who had extensive experience in improving science culture and practice. And the details of the event have been published uh, in an article, I'll give you that link later, um, but the results of the discussion and the outcome of the discussion of the two days um, are all posted in a preprint on osf.io right here. And the preprint's called Empowering early career researchers to improve science. So I'll just start by saying thank you to all the participants who, who attended the event, Welcome Trust who provided some funding, and a special thanks uh, to my co-organizers of the event, Tracy Weisgeber and Constance, who hopefully is asleep in bed in Germany. So the unconference covered um, four main topics. The first was why do we need early career researchers to improve science? The second was what obstacles do early career researchers face when working to improve science? The third was how can others support early career researchers working to improve science? And we've, we let, final at, or left concluded with tips and strategies for early career researchers working to, on science reform, um, drawing from the experiences of the 54 participants to say what worked, what didn't work, what do you wish you knew um, at the beginning? And so when we say trying to promote science reform or trying to improve science, we really need, mean a broad range of different topics. So some groups are working on trying to improve and modernize publishing um, with open access journal articles. Uh, other groups are working on reproducibility of science. Uh, others are really focused on changing the rewards and the incentives. 
Um, other initiatives are focused on public involvement and promoting science communication. There's also those that are trying to increase diversity in science and make sure that there are more perspectives from around the globe. Uh, and as well, early career research their training and working conditions. So there's just a wide range of topics that we're referring to when we're talking about science improvement and science reform. So why do we need early career researchers to be part of the reform efforts? Well, early career researchers are the future leaders. They're the most diverse cohort of scientists, so much more diverse than their mid-career and senior scientists co colleagues. Early career researchers, because they're early in their career, may be more open to new solutions than more senior scientists who have had their careers, built their careers in the system that that is now. Early career researchers are also more often on the forefront of technical innovations because they're actively doing the science. They're still at the bench. They're still seeing the innovation that's happening and being a part of it at the bench, in the lab, in the field. Um, and so they're really aware of where changes can be made and, um, and how improvements could actually benefit the science and how it's done. Some early career researchers may also have the time and energy uh, to, pr to put into research improvement activities in a way that sometimes more senior researchers, more senior academics who have a lot more responsibilities and commitments may not have. And importantly, early career researchers are the largest cohort of scientists. So if we are going to see improvements in science, if we are going to see reform efforts actually come to reality, we need early career researchers to be a part of it. So to learn more about the outcome of our result of the event, please see the preprint. We also have another document on osf.io with the specific tips and tricks for early career researchers working to improve science. And we have an article um, which explains how we brought together scientists and researchers from around the world um, in an asynchronous virtual unconference. So I encourage you to please check out these resources uh, to see more details. But today we have a wonderful panelist who will each um, speak for about five minutes um, about their initiatives and their experience with early career researchers improving science. So I'd like, um, oh, and just to note, please put your questions in the Q&A and, and not the chat. We'll have Q&A at the end. So um, first up is Dr. Humberto Debat, who is a research scientist with a permanent position at the Institute of Plant Pathology in the Center of Agronomic Research of the National Institute of Agriculture Technology in Argentina. Humberto studies the interface of viruses and crops from a systems biology perspective and for the past year has worked in the Argentine project on SARS-CoV-2 genomics. Humberto is a member of the Advisory Committee in Open Science and Citizen Science of the Ministry of Science of Argentina and has been an ASAP Bio Ambassador, an eLife Community Ambassador, an affiliate of the Bio Archive Preprint Server, and co-developer of Panlingua, a multilingual discovery and reading tool for preprints in the life sciences. So Humberto, did you want to um, show slides to share your screen? Uh, well, I, I don't have slides to share. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Great. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Kent. It's a pleasure to be here. So the majority of scholarly work in biology is published in English, a language most of the world does not speak. To help remedy this key issue, hindering inclusive scientific dialogue, we built Panlingua, a multilingual preprint search tool intended to enable search and global access to machine translations of all preprints hosted at bioarchives. At Panlingua, users can enter search terms in their native language and view search results linking to the full text of all available articles translated into more than 100 languages. But language is just one of the barriers affecting global scientific communication, especially among our communities. Latin America represents 8% of the world population, 4% of researchers, and 5% of global academic publications. 30% of our people lack access to internet, 30% is poor, 62 million live in extreme poverty. We are a region of asymmetries and contradictions with tremendous disparities, culturally diverse, with one of the lowest global R&D spending. We are thriving societies. We produce awesome publicly funded science. Our salaries are ridiculously low. We are resilient, hardworking, creative minds. We are so poor. Doing science in Latin America is about passion, empathy, solidarity, community, and responsibility. 
as we wave our manuscript around with our humble results, balancing visibility, affordability, and institutional requirements, we fight to disseminate our findings wherever we find them fit for months, sometimes for years, in disadvantage against all odds, despite setbacks. In addition, we are seeing a transition in the publishing ecosystem. The ground is moving. The advancements of the open access movement is a flag towards the democratization of knowledge. Nevertheless, we perceive that this flag has been co-opted by some players in the industry, which have accommodated their business model in a way that could perpetuate the asymmetries of scholar publishing and exclude even more researchers from the scholar communications. We are seeing a shift from paywalls to published walls. We are observing the preposterous inflation and expansion of the so-called article processing charges, which are not only unaffordable for our region, they are unethical. The discussions about APCs transcends open science. It's a discussion about constructing views of academic communication. It's about privilege and social justice. It's about inclusion. To encourage APCs is to view scientific knowledge as a commodity rather than a human right, rather than a public good. Brazil spent $36 million between 2012 and 2016 on APCs, equivalent to the cost of providing sanitized water for a year to more than eight of the 77 million Latin Americans who do not have access to drinking water. I live in a country where 80% of scientific activity is financed with public funds and where 40 of the population is poor. Our graduate students have incomes below the poverty line. This scenario impl implies that it is scandalous to pay exorbitant figures so that five publishing companies that exercise an illegal poly in an imperfect market continue to accumulate wealth. We are, we are expectant of where with our 5% of articles will end up, how this figure may diverge. As ECRs, we need to be a part on a shift on publishing practice, encouraging the non-commercial goods of academic communications and supporting the development and maintenance of communication infrastructure led by and for the academy. It is becoming evident that many journals reflect anachronic 20th century pre-digital platforms, elitist, reserved for certain affiliations, valuing mostly mainstream science, a benefit for the few, a chat along, among privileged and highly funded research, many white, many rich, mostly men. I am failing to perceive how the academic publishing ecosystem values diversity which routes they plan to take to modernize their journals, how are they working to make their venues more inclusive with more gender balance, to be platforms that embrace more voices from the South where science is a global conversation. Beyond publishing, our funders should be redirecting the resource we spend on subscriptions. 11 Latin American countries spend $100 million, mostly uh, uh, public funds, on access to academic journals last year. 80% corresponded to the five largest commercial publishers. We're giving millions to reach scientific knowledge that should be free. We should immediately cancel this waste of research in Leonine contracts with the commercial publishing industry who has sequestered our scientific legacy. This issue transcends academic publications and involves research assessment practice. We are affected by monopolies of the indexing systems and bibliometric indicators that unfailingly accentuated the dichotomy of mainstream and peripheral science, resulting in, as Cameron Nilo says, excellent in research as a neocolonial agenda. I think we have an opportunity in this context to break the vicious circle that commercializes evaluative cultures, to bet on circulation indicators over journal metrics, and redirect our indicators towards the public impact of our work beyond impact factors. We must remember that our research agendas must be aligned with the prosperity of our region and not with the imposition of a defined recipe for success in a northern market. We are not in academia to accumulate publications in journals to advance our careers as individuals. Science is a collective enterprise that has to look towards society and understand its demand for knowledge. The way to strengthen our communication system is to align it to our society, to our needs, to our history. The real impact of our research has nothing to do with rankings. Our communication system is a strength if it is faced in society to the extent that it generates inclusion and well-being of our people. And that, I think, is where ECR should lead a wave of change. Science is a shared enterprise, a global endeavor enriched by the multiplicity of visions, realities, and languages. Everybody, everyone benefits from the development of a more inclusive ecosystem and seamless international scholarly discourse is a real possibility. Many barriers are stopping this utopia. As ECRs, we have the opportunity to transform research culture. Let's embrace this responsibility. Thank you.
Thank you, Humberto. So our next panelist is Dr. Nafisa Jadavi, who is a neuroscientist and assistant professor at Midwestern University and research professor at Carleton University. Her laboratory investigates how the brain responds to different biological processes throughout the lifespan, and specifically how maternal nutrition contributes to offspring neurodevelopment, neurological diseases, and aging. She is the chair of the advisory board for reproducibility for everyone. Thank you for joining, Nafisa. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kant, for that introduction, um, and thanks for including me in this panel. Are you able to see my slides? Yep, yeah. looks good. Okay. Perfect, thank you. So um, I'm gonna speak a little bit about the Reproducibility for Everyone initiative that I've been a part of for a few, few years. Um, Dr. Or Tracy has also been part of this um, initiative as well. Um, so the Reproducibility for Everyone initiative is um, a community-led education uh, program where we try to um, increase uh, the discovery and adaptation of reproducibility tools at scale. Um, and so what we do is we run workshops um, at different um, uh, meeting, scientific meetings, um, at um, different institutions to educate individuals about reproducibility tools. Um, and since um, the initiative has started in 2018, we've had about 100 plus volunteers that have run over um, 50 workshops um, across the world. These are international workshops um, that have included over 3000 participants. Um, so we've been really, really active in getting um, this information out in terms of different tools that can be used by researchers, um, early career researchers um, specifically, as well as uh, um, mid-career or late career researchers in terms of implementing tools in their uh, research laboratories. Um, and why we started this initiative was that there was um, a lot of things that were missing um, in terms of uh, reproducibility in that discussion in the biomedical uh, sciences and in other science fields. Um, you know, the majority of researchers being uh, left behind. Um, and in terms of scaling, um, these initiatives and different tools that can be used to be reproducible. Um, there was that uh, missing link. And in terms of focusing on how um, an individual researcher's um, work can benefit was also missing. And um, what we wanted to do was to include innovative um, ideas that could easily be implemented by researchers that attended our, our educational workshops. And so one thing that we end off our workshops with is, you know, we present a lot of information, but we also ask researchers, you know, I know you're overwhelmed, we've shared a lot of ideas, but, you know, take one thing and try and implement it into your daily um, research program, you know, something like an electronic lab notebook or writing up protocols or things like that. Um, to help move your research um, forward in terms of it being um, more reproducible. And so these, what our workshops do, which I've hinted at a little bit um, as I've been talking is that they provide this overview um, of different open projects that um, researchers can get involved in. Um, and what we try and do is we keep our, our workshops to about 30 to 90 minutes and we try and target a really large um, variety of audiences, so in a number of fields, plant sciences to the biomedical sciences. Um, and we try to hit all the different career stages because anyone can really implement the tools that we discuss in our uh, workshops um, if that's something that they want to do into their research program. Um, we recently published our work um, in eLife um, outlining our reproducibility for everyone initiative and you know what we do and how we do it. All of our workshop material is freely available on our website. Um, you can also, individuals can also watch workshops that have been recorded. Um, and we often get um, instructors or facilitators for our workshops that have been prior attendees. Um, and so if you're interested in getting involved um, or learning more, please you know, visit our website, um, don't be shy. And we're always looking for people to get involved and volunteer in different aspects 
of our initiative. So um, we're looking to get a lot of people involved. Um, we have um, some funding from the CDI initiative, um, as well as other sponsors that I'd like to thank um, for supporting us throughout the years and currently um, to let us do our great work and to have a permanent staff member who does a lot of um, the infrastructural work and initiatives. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Oh, I was muted. Um, just a reminder that <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A box um, and we will get to them at the end. Uh, so next up is Dr. Gary McDowell, who has a background in biomedical research and co-founded the nonprofit Future of Research, which seeks to advocate for and with early career researchers to achieve systemic change in the academy. He ran Future of Research for three years full time and has now continued working to help future generations of researchers to reach their potential in his new role as a consultant, providing expertise on the early career researcher population to organizations and providing early career researchers with strategies to affect change. Welcome, Gary. Hey, thanks, uh, Dr. Kent, and thanks to everyone here. Uh, it's so great to see you. Um, so I have been uh, involved with advocating for and with early career researchers for uh, getting on for eight years now. Um, first, as, as Dr. Kent mentioned, in the nonprofit Future of Research. Um, and that organization sought to communicate the issues faced by early career researchers in their academic environments and propose solutions to overcome those problems. And we did this primarily by hosting conferences or workshops uh, we would gather lots of people in the room, um, we would talk through the problems and the issues that people were having, uh, and then try to come up with solutions, um, strategic ways of overcoming those problems. And then we as an organization would take those things forward and communicate those to stakeholders such as funding organizations and universities. Um, I continue to work in this space as a consultant, um, and as Dr. Kent said, more specifically helping organizations think about how to better serve this population um, and generally just sort of working as a freelance academic in a space thinking about uh, grad students and postdocs. Um, so on the issue of uh, including early career researchers in science improvement, uh, for me, this is really um, an issue of representation. Uh, most of the organizations and institutions that hold power in science and in the research enterprise, um, their, their most powerful committees and structures are dominated by faculty. Um, dominated by senior faculty and also dominated by faculty from a select group of institutions uh, and so are not representative globally, um, even within countries, um, uh, even of all faculty. Um, and so in order to have a realistic sense of what research looks like in order to make decisions in those structures, uh, it's really important to have representation and that includes across career stage um, and particularly thinking about the people who are um, certainly in biomedicine, which is my background, the people who are at the bench doing the research, what the day-to-day -day looks like for them um, and what their uh, environment is like in trying to succeed as scientists, succeed as researchers and to, to take the science they're working on forward. Um, it's really important that they, they be in the room. Uh, and so that was a lot of the work of, uh, of Future of Research included trying to get more representation of people into those uh, powerful places into those rooms. Uh, and as someone who sat in some of those rooms myself as the, the first young person in, in some committees, uh, it's really kind of scary, some of the, the misconceptions that there are uh, when those voices are not there. So representation is, is very, very important. I think one of the, the key lessons that came up for us um, was the need to have a broad ecosystem of people affecting change. And I think one of the things that was really useful in having um, uh, someone in a full-time role like myself who was outside the academy, uh, who had left the traditional structure uh, and was so no, no longer subject to um, concerns about existing in that structure. Um, I'm able to speak much more freely uh, about uh, what people are experiencing um, and I often try to speak from a place of gathering data and communicating that data um, very data focused and so that has been really helpful um, in trying to communicate things um, uh, 
Uh, and I think it's it's important to try and consider having people outside the academy and within um, as one vector of, of thinking of, of who in the science ecosystem is involved in these conversations. Um, and that has certainly been really helpful for, for a lot of the things we were working on. I think it's important too to think about a, a broader connection of um, uh, all kinds of people in the system trying to affect change, including early career researchers, because we find that not only is there the problem of general turnover um, of grad students and postdocs in temporary positions, um, sometimes even on faculty, but uh, there's an issue that within advocacy, there can be quite a high rate of burnout. And so um, trying to spread work across numerous people and across numerous organizations and really collaborate and work together uh, and share ideas and share knowledge is really important. Uh, and that's actually why um, the, the unconference um, that, that we all participated in was such a great event. I was able to learn so much and hear about what was going on elsewhere and really I think this is sort of the next phase um, in, in the, the landscape of early career researchers affecting change. I think there's a lot of groups now who have gotten to grips with the, the issues of establishing themselves, of setting up and of starting to, to get their, their foot in the door. And now I think it's important for us to try to think about all of us connecting together better. Um, um, and, and certainly thinking about being in the US, uh, researchers are told to be very independent and there's a big drive to be working independently. Um, and so I think it's hard for a lot of academics to try and think about changing um, the system uh, with other people and together. So I think we, we have to, to think about that a lot more. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. Great. Thank you, Gary. Um, and our, our last panelist is Dr. Kleber Neves. I'm so glad uh, that your internet hasn't <laughs> been affected by the storm. Um, Dr. Neves is part of the coordinating team of the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative. He has a PhD in neurosciences and a, a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Science from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. His neuroscience research focuses on brain evolution and complex networks. And since 2018, he has worked on the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative and on the No Budget Science Hack Week, as well as on many meta science research projects on issues relating to reproducibility, preprints, and translational research. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I was lucky. So the lights just went out like five minutes before this started, but it seems to be fine now. Can you all see the screen? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, well, thank you for the, inv the invitation. Uh, Brienne mentioned that I, uh, I'm from Rio de Janeiro. And so I've worked in meta science in two main initiatives, which is one is the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative. I'm part of the coordinating team. Team, and well, this is a, a replication effort, much in, in the mode of, of the ones that came before, like uh, the replication project psychology or cancer biology, <coughs> where we're we're gathering uh, multiple labs to to reproduce experiments that were published pretty much in line with, with the, the previous panel about big team science. It's one of those. And we're, we're, this is, is ongoing. And the other the other initiative, which has a, a meta scientific band is no budget science, which started before used uh, meta science as a term for as a name for this. But we were discussing what would be meta scientific issues in, in the university back in, in 2016, 15. And this eventually evolved to become a, a more training focused initiative when it became a hack week, which is now and well, we just had it the third edition uh, last month. And well, this is people gathering from for, for two weeks or one week and trying to develop projects on meta science or tools to, to improve science somehow. And this has been going on. Uh, both have, have generous funding from the Serra Pileira Institute, which is a, a, a private funder of science in Brazil. So uh, regarding early career researchers, so, so no budget science is more focused for training and it's more directly related to the issues we discuss in the, the, the virtual brainstorm paper, the unconference. Uh, but but the, the insight I, I want to bring from the, the lesson learned 
from from these two initiatives is that uh, one thing that we mentioned in in the, the introduction that uh, ACRs so, so postdocs graduate students or or even in our case even the, the PIs that are part of, of our collaborating teams actually are is still very young and these are the ones doing the experiments and, and, and you know discussing with us the coordinating team the the, the nitty-gritty of the the, the protocols so uh, these are the people who are actually caring about about and implementing all, all the recommendations we do in terms of, of reproducibility and uh, no budget science is very focused on, on on training so and usually again as mentioned in the introduction uh, the, the people who have time to engage in training in new fields and all usually uh, are, are ECRs right and uh, on the one hand having ECRs being the ones who are engaged in improving science in meta science uh, it's great, right? Because uh, they, they are the future. They, they hopefully will be here for a long time, and and uh, this early exposition to to the issues in meta science will will have a, a long lasting impact in their careers, and they will uh, hopefully uh, spread that to to other people, and that's a, a great uh, strong suit for for ECRs. But on the other hand, uh, these are the people who are collecting the data, and the people who are caring about improving data collection and and how we do science in general. These are the people who are in uh, lowest on the, 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 the academic hierarchy and they are uh, they have unstable jobs and they don't have uh, much certainty about the future. They don't even know uh, if they're going to be able to, to remain in academia. And that is, uh, you know, the, this reality varies from, from place to place, but uh, I, I think that there, there's some universal truth here. Of course, this is all based on, on my impression. I'd love to hear about, about data on, on on this and and one thing we do see in particular and, and it's made me think a lot is that uh from no budget science we get the experience that that people come and from those two weeks where they're there during the event the hack week and it's very collaborative and everybody's on zoom all the time because we're doing virtual events now and during those two weeks it's very great and the projects uh, move very fast but after those two weeks it's it's often the, the people just drop out of the projects, right? Because, you know, they have other priorities. So this has made me think of, of uh, the survival of meta science as a field or the movement for improving science, if you, if you don't want to talk about the discipline itself. But uh, uh, this whole motivation to improve science, if it's really dependent on the motivation and will and free time of ECRs, uh, it's it's not really sustainable because, uh, uh, you know, it, it, as long as meta science activities are not rewarded, people when 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 push comes to shove they will prioritize the thing that gets them jobs and 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 papers and publications and the things that actually make you you advance your career in academia or, or even the things that give you opportunities outside of academia and i think this this ties in to to uh, one of the first panels in, in the morning today or my morning that uh that was talking about uh how we should go about institutionalizing meta science and i think the institutionalization of meta science maybe i don't think it's a good idea to create meta science departments but uh how meta science will become a, a more mainstream part of, of the academic structure will in, in large part be determined by or will determine how ecrs will will uh, come in to, to more permanent positions and how they will become a part of academia in the long term so uh, I'll, I'll end up on that note and I, I ask you that you, you confirm or disconfirm my impressions that this is the case. I, I don't know if there's much data on that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now we'll t turn, well, actually first, I do wanna give uh, Tracy an opportunity if you want to say anything um, or have any comments before we turn to the Q&A. Yeah, I think, um, thank you to all our panelists for joining. I think our goal was to give you a sense of some of the various different things that ECRs are working on and the power that ECR initiatives can have in changing so many different aspects of science. But I would also ask you to remember that this is a really small portion of the participants are in, you know, our original event. Um, where we had a lot of dynamic discussions about not just what people are doing, but how they are doing it. 
and what we can learn from other ECRs who have been successful in founding initiatives, in leading initiatives, um, in building communities around their initiatives, often in very difficult circumstances. And often these are um, very widespread or global communities, like for example, Nafisa's example of reproducibility for everyone. Um, and so I think I would really encourage you to use the symposium to ask questions about how to do those things and not just to focus on what it is that people are doing. Great. Thank you, Tracy. So we have one question that's come through the chat, but I do encourage um, attendees to put their questions in the Q&A box um, so that everyone can read it. Uh, so this question um, is for Dr. McDowell. Um, Dr. McDowell, you had made a point that we need to get more organized in the way that we advocate for change. For example, across the various ECR or open science initiatives and organizations. In other industries, unions are a powerful mechanism for organizing individuals to take action collectively. Yet we don't have a union for the global research community. Is it time we create an open science union to advocate for progress and researchers' interests? Great question. Um, I'm very pro union generally. So um, I, you know, unions have great power in affecting this kind of change. Um, I think this gets to the, the point of we don't need to necessarily reinvent the wheel. There are people in this world who are very effective at, um, at pushing for change and advocating for change. And it'd be great to like use those structures and lessons in, in our own context. Uh, I mean, one thing that this made me think of is I'm really disappointed with a lot of scientific societies right now in this space because um, I am a member of some societies that have been advocating to block my access to papers because I don't work at university. I don't have institutional access to publications. Um, and so, um, you know, I have to get them through SciHub essentially. And um, yeah, I, I find myself in the weird position um, in the States uh, in the last couple of years advocating to the Trump administration, which was one of the greatest champions for um, open publications in the States uh, because of the pushback against, uh, against it from scientific societies and, and publishing organizations. And so I think there is more, it'd be interesting to, to, to think about, is there a need to think about a society that is focused on science rather than um, academics and the, the way academia, uh, protecting academic interests. I, I was really struck by something Humberto said of, you know, that, that the point of science is to solve problems and to, to, to do this research. It's not to publish papers and it's not careerism. And that frankly is a major reason that I left because it's, um, that is the direction that I, I sadly see things are in. And so I, I think that, this is a, a super important point of like the what organizations should there be broadly it it could be a union but is it that there's a problem also with the structures that we have scary um so another question now is for humberto humberto sorry um which obstacles do you think affect ecrs um specifically in latin america like what are the obstacles that are more prevalent for ECRs in, in Latin America? Well, uh, during my short talk, I mentioned poverty, which is a very important issue in the region, that all, which uh, affects uh, broadly all our lives activities in, and puts uh, in a different perspective our role as scientists. What uh, Gary mentioned uh, just uh, before is that we have a, a very important responsibility because we are financed by taxpayer money in, in countries where there is a lot of lack of funding and, uh, and, and budgets for social and health, etc. So uh, every time that there is some um, funding to do research, you really have to think what, what you should be doing with that money. Uh, what uh, what is that research going to help your society, the people where you live, and, uh, and of course during the pandemic that 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 has raised it a lot. It's like we have joined forces with many ECRs 
uh, uh, in our countries, in, in, in different regions, to try to, to, to prevent the loss of, of, of life. So that it, it, it's, a, it's like a different issue. Before the pandemic, we were like thinking in very uh, separated, uh, without a, a real community, without in, integrating our capacities. And I think that the pandemic has helped us uh, try to understand that we are towards the same path, that, that we all together want the same thing, which is to try to, to, to generate knowledge that, that is useful for our societies. So in that sense, uh, I think that, the, that one of the main issues that we have now is try to convince our leaders that investing in science is, uh, is the best way to try to solve the problems of this society. So a lot of effort that we have to do is try to push into the authorities to try to provide more, 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 more funding for our activities. And, and being ECRs, the, the, the most prevalent research, researchers all over the world, as you haven't mentioned before, we are like uh, most of the people doing science. So we should join forces to try to push uh, to, to, uh, to uh, an agenda where, where funded is a reality and we can solve problems in our societies with a specific budget in the long term is more specifically. Thank you. Our next May question. On, sure, of course. I add on what Umberto just said? That, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think this is something that I think about a lot, that meta science is very focused, at least so far, on, on how we do science, right? That uh, how we get the answers and how we get answers that we can trust. And I think the whole point about useful knowledge and, and knowledge that is relevant to society and to local concerns is really about the watch like what questions do we want to answer and and well of course we need good answers but there's a reflection that comes before that it's about the contents not not the, the, the method yeah that's such a good point so our next question uh, is for tracy i was watching your presentation on metrics today and it seems that follow-up of students is good in your initiative and they finish the project i think that has a huge overlap with the questions raised by Kleber. How you and Kleber think that ECRs could be more consistent with these initiatives, no budget science and your initiative with Quest. So how could ECRs be more consistent with these and follow through? Okay, um, I'll briefly provide some context for those who were not in the, in the metrics webinar earlier today. Um, essentially, so I started an initiative through the eLife Ambassadors program called the eLife Ambassadors Meta Research Team, where participants learn about meta research by working together to design, conduct, and publish a meta research study. Um, and I've since translated that into a six month course that I run in Berlin with students from four different Berlin universities. Um, and I think one of the things that's one of the things that's really important in the success of our projects and the reason students are able to finish is that they're all working together on the same project. And so if students are sort of individually working on an idea, um, they get to a point where they realize they don't have the resources, it's going to take a larger team than they have. And at that point, it becomes difficult to proceed with the project, especially if they don't have outside support from their supervisor or others in their lab group or community. And so part of how initiative, our initiative works is the fact that everyone agrees that, you know, we have this goal coming in to design, conduct, and publish a meta-research study. Um, and then it's also that because participants are often working in small groups, no one wants to be holding the group back. And so everyone is motivated to, you know, keep working and keep moving their part of the project forward. And they see other groups doing the same thing in our meeting every week. Um, and we also use other ways of motivating. So we encourage, like we've done blog posts or other things so that students have an early output to share the work that they're doing or the things that they're learning. Um, the students have in the past found conferences where they can share abstracts and start to talk to their about, to other scientists about their meta research. And so those are some of the strategies that we use to keep people motivated and moving forward in our initiative. Um, and I think Kleber can perhaps address the question more related to the No Budget Science Week. Yeah. I actually heard about your, your talk and metrics earlier because other people from the group were there and, and said it was very relevant and I should have been there. But uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I was actually trying to, to, to learn from you because uh, we, we actually have very, very you know, bad follow up 
and we are now experimenting. This is the third edition. We always change the format a bit, and we're experimenting now with, with regular meetings. So one month after, two months after, we would try to, to follow up closely to the projects to see if, if something comes up, if people have a, a longer term commitment. But I'll know if this works in, in six months, maybe. Yeah, I think the group mentoring approach can be a very powerful one, um, as well as emphasizing to people from the beginning that they will need a team and to think about who they might be able to get and encourage to join their team. Um, so I'll, I'll share a link in a chat for a couple minutes for a paper that talks about our initiative for um, running a participant guided learn by doing meta research course, which has more details for those who are interested. Thank you. So the next question I think is um, directed at Nafisa. Um, I am a young neuroscientist and I have the impression that the scientific endeavor has become about selecting convenient data to publish convenient stories. I think venues like this conference are very useful, but I have the impression that tomorrow I will go to work and life will continue to be about finding significant differences and putting aside what does not go in that direction. How to involve academic directives in the direction of open and reproducible science? Okay, that's a great question. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so yes, I mean, the academic currency is publications, right? And there are journals that are very um, pro-significant differences in telling the story. Um, but I think that there is a movement um, about publishing negative data and data that is not, you know, significant. Um, unfortunately, um, this movement is really slow. Um, and there's a lot of resistance to it because we want to, you know, cure X disease or X or, you know, whatever, insert your field of study here. Um, so I think, you know, um, it's definitely hard, a hard place to be as a trainee um, when you're in a lab that maybe is pushing for um, publications and positive data and significant differences. Um, but I think um, what I would recommend or, or trying to, to, to do is to build a network of people that are more, you know, that might be open-minded towards not that viewpoint and to get them involved potentially with your work um, and to get feedback. Um, I always advocate to my trainees and other trainees and students is to, to build a community or a network of people um, and to get feedback on how you can, um, you know, uh, um, sort of start this change within your area or within your um, school or program or, or whatever, wherever you may be. Um, I mean, it can seem very daunting because the scientific world is, you know, um, very old and some people are very set in certain ways. Um, but I think that if you're able to make some change where you are, then that's, um, that's great. That's some people that were affected by your way of thinking about data and that, you know, it's not always has, there doesn't always have to be a significant difference. Um, you know, this is something that I've tried to do when I've started my own group is to, to foster this way of thinking and that, you know, I am, yeah, the PI and my name goes on the paper and the grants and stuff, but we have a discussion about the data and what it means and, and you know, people, we all work together. I'm at the bench, students are at the bench, staff are at the bench. And so, um, uh, and it's my little lab, but I think that, you know, I'm training students that are going off and doing their, you know, their future training in other places. So hopefully I'm trying to sort of plant these little seeds of, of change, even, you know, um, in, in an area or in a field that is very um, dominated by finding significant differences because I too myself am also a neuroscientist too. So hopefully that answers your question or gives you some uh, uh, feedback on this very um, touchy subject. <laughs> um, 
speaking of touchy subjects, the next question <laughs> is, um, and it's not directed at any one individual, but I can, uh, I'm sure several of you may have um, thoughts. Do you think there is a selection effect where early career researchers who stay in academia and become senior researchers are the ones who are least bothered by the system? As people like yourselves either leave or pivot into meta research, how can we strategically get reformers into positions of power? Would any of the panelists like to tackle that? I, I will give it a go because I have given this a lot of thought. Yeah. Um, I think there's a broad distribution effect where the simple answer could be yes, but I think there's a lot of caveats here. And the first is uh, there's a phenomenon in, in business research, actually, that people who resign from organizations generally, um, there can often be a common factor that they are the people who care the most about it and just cannot persist in that space any longer. They care so much. And I think that there, there's certainly that element that played in for me. But I think there are people who try to find a way of um, uh, what it is that their values align with um, and whether they can affect change based on what it is that they can see being able to do. Uh, Nafisa just said change is very slow in the academy, which is true. And I think this is a big part of why I just didn't have the patience for that. And so that I think I think all of these factors come in for, for what determines, but I think it, it's, it raises an important point that some of the things I have heard uh, that are the most awful uh, about like how the academy shouldn't change have come from very junior people um, junior faculty and because there are a subset who are super bought into the system because they have succeeded in it and there's a lot of this it, it is important not to try and like have a broad brush of oh all junior faculty do this and all postdocs do that and all these people do this because there is there is a great spectrum of people bought into it um, and people not bought into it and I think you will have some stay and some go um, I think it takes, it just takes a lot of persistence to stay in um, if you also see the system is broken. And so I have my favorite faculty to work with are the ones who are, who are like really see the problems and then are also trying to figure out how, how to deal with that. But there are some who it's, I, I, think, I think it helps a lot of people not to be bothered by it or you know that they just are bought into the system and that's their way of dealing. And so I think that that issue can certainly arise. Um, and I had, when I was leaving, I had people say to me, oh, it's such a shame that you're leaving. Um, and, you know, you should stay or whatever. And I was like, well, I don't really want to. But also, I think there, I think there is a, again, this speaks to the, the earlier point of, I feel I'm more helpful outside than I would be inside. I feel I would have been a terrible PI trying to have, like, mentor people and do work and also try to do this. I don't think I would have been very good at, at, at any of it. And so I think better distribution of labor and supporting each other is is key there and so um yeah but but again getting and then we need to help the people who are still in the academy who are good people to get into those positions of power i think this is all again the reinforcement and the the, the network uh needing to be to be strong yeah and, and like gary said there are people at every career stage who are, are fighting the good fight you know there are there it's not we're here talking about the role of early career researchers but so much of what early career researchers can do is really working with some people who are in these positions of power. So certainly you have people bought into the system at every stage and you also have people actively using their positions of power to also promote change. So um, I think that was a good point. Would anyone else like to speak to that or should we go to the next question? Um, I can briefly add a point, Humberto, very cute dog. That was not my point. Um, my, my point was that the, the key thing that we kept hearing over and over in the young conference, and you'll see it prominently placed in the preprint was people were saying over and over this work that I do to improve science is not rewarded. It's not incentivized. Um, and it can actually, it's actually in some cases perceived as a distraction that takes away from my ability to get grants and publish papers. And until that changes, it's going to be very hard to keep people in the system. Um, outside of psychology, it can be very difficult to find journals that publish meta research. It's hard to find funders that will fund it. There are lots of people who don't think it's research and there are very few 
um, places where meta researchers can get jobs within the scientific system. And so I think solving that for not just meta researchers, but people doing all aspects of science improvement is really critical to change. I also think that just finding um, if you can, a space in the system where you can make change is really important. For me, I started doing meta science because I was frustrated by people using bar graphs of continuous data just constantly. And so we published a meta research paper on it in 2015, which went viral very, very quickly and contributed to policy changes in a lot of journals. And for me, that really just shifted my horizon of what was possible. Um, and over time, I became less and less interested in the more physiological research that I was doing and more and more interested in, you know, not just how do I publish this paper, but how do I do more meta science in a way that I can see it having an impact, that I can see it changing journal policies, changing laboratory behavior, changing the way that authors think about and engage with their data. And so I think if you can find a place within the system, you can, that will help um, some of these feelings of discord. And if you don't find that place within the system or it's just not something you wanna look for and you would rather be Gary and help to work to improve things from outside, I think that is also amazing. Um, Gary needs friends and we need more people like Gary. So I don't think there's any shame in saying, you know, I need to leave the system in order to be able to do what I wanna do. I think if you need to leave the system, do what you wanna do, just do that. Well said, we need more Gary's. <laughs> Um, so I think this will probably be our last question, and I think it's a good one to end on, is can participants talk about how getting involved in reform and or meta research has benefited their careers? We talk a lot about how advocacy work, pushing for reform is seen as a distraction, it's not incentivized, but does anybody have an example of how actually participating in this work has helped their career? I, I can say if no, but go no. If you said please go, yeah, no, 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 no please. It's, it's I want to hear from the panelists. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think my work with reproducibility um, for everyone has really, when I started my independent research group, has really helped me um, set up an infrastructure where we can do reproducible science. I hope that's my hope. It's been only a few years, and so I think that's been really great the friendships that I have made um, being involved in these different initiatives have been amazing. Um, and the support and the different opportunities that have presented themselves have, I think, been really, have enriched my um, uh, scientific career. And I'm grateful uh, for what I've, um, you know, what I've contributed and what I've also, you know, uh, received, I guess, as being a part of these initiatives. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thank you, absolutely. I think it, for me, it's like growing the network, um, which has led to new collaboration scientifically, new grant applications, invitations to things um, that even though often, it, but by some people it is seen as a distraction from science. Um, I certainly have had the same experience as uh, Nafisa and there are new opportunities that actually do help uh, my science by just building my network. Any other examples? Um, I mean, I was I was just kind of throwing. I mean, the most obvious tangible example was the work I did as a postdoc. Ended up in me getting a three-year grant to set up and run Future of Research, um, and you know I've continued to work in this space. Um, and I, it's funny, all the things I enjoyed about being an academic: um, publishing papers, applying for grants, getting rejected from grants, which happened recently. You know, I can you can still do that outside, outside of a university. You can still get rejected from a grant, and. Um, uh, but you, you know, you can still do, I, I think this is part of the, the interesting thing is that people think the academy is the only place to do things, whereas the academy is a structure, you know, I've worked in the academy in a non-profit and in, in a for-profit, but essentially an LLC, um, a, a business setup. And, you know, all of these are just ways of, of having a structure in which to do this kind of work. And you can still participate in doing all of these kinds of things. And I collaborate and I'm still part of all kinds of networks because of this kind of work. So. My career, you know, I used to work on frogs and I, you know, nobody knows what my frog work now. And like, I have this completely different academic career um, that's based in, in all of this great stuff. So um, yeah, it can, it can take you in a new and more interesting direction is, is my perspective. Yeah. 
Great. Well, thank you. This was a nice note to end on. I think something positive. Um, so thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you, Tracy, for joining. Uh, this was really a wonderful discussion uh, and it was great to see everybody. So thank you. And thank you to all the attendees um, who asked really great questions and took the time uh, to join us today. Thank you.